Open now the depths of your heart to find eternity and live for more than your eyes can see. Give God the glory for all eternity. In our previous two videos, we went over six important rules for understanding Scripture that are actually rules for modern jury trials. If you didn't catch those, I'll make the first of those two studies one of the links at the end of this video. Now, we need to add four more rules that become necessary due to the very nature of law and communication. First, when the Bible assumes its readers correctly believe, then we must believe. The very beginning of the Bible assumes the existence of God, Genesis 1.1. The Bible never tries to prove that, but assumes the reader already believes it to be so. Every time God punishes sinners for their sins, we may be sure that God's attitude toward all sinners is the same. Every time God calls for sinners to repent, it is assumed that sinners are capable of repenting. We're not asked to doubt that. We are expected to already understand this fact. This especially applies to religious doctrines, teaching that people can only repent when God empowers them by a special gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, God knows whether sinners are capable of repenting and calls on them to do so. Either they are capable and are expected to do so, or God is fooling us by pretending that they are capable. In addition, if a character is said to be in one place, he will not be in another place at the same time. The writer intends for the reader to understand where that character is. Why would the gospel writers have us believe that Jesus was in three places at once at his baptism? In the water, the voice from heaven, and the descending spirit. Some teach that. But the gospels were written for the reader to understand, and we see a father, a son, and a holy spirit in three separate places at once. So when the Bible assumes a reader believes, we must not doubt it. If I, as a reader, do not believe an assumed fact, for example, the existence of God or God's attitude toward all sinners, etc., then I don't believe the Bible to be true. I must either study the evidences of divine inspiration or abandon a study of Scripture. Now, why would I try to interpret a book I don't believe? It would kind of be very much like the folk wisdom of teaching a pig to sing. Well, second... When a cause for something is stated in Scripture, we cannot doubt what is stated. This is obviously related to the previous rule. Critics sometimes try to explain Bible miracles away, and Bible students are sometimes sucked into the practice of using their natural explanation to make the Bible seem more plausible. One such explanation tells us that the cause of the waters turning to blood in Egypt was algae. When we conclude this, we've turned from interpreting the Bible and started denying it. The Bible says it was blood. Now, I know that it could be a figure of speech based on the apparent look of the water, but God didn't ask us to explain it for him. It was foretold by God and Moses, and it occurred, and it was called blood. Scientists sometimes try to explain the parting of the Red Sea by a natural phenomenon. The Bible clearly describes it as a miracle with walls of water on each side of the Israelites as they pass through. The fall of Jericho was either by God's power or the sometimes claimed earthquake. While interpreting Scripture, causes stated in Scripture cannot be doubted. This isn't just a problem of accepting miracles. It's a question of taking God at His word, whether it makes sense to us or not. How God saves us from our sins is not dependent on our wisdom or ability to understand. Whether any method chosen by God makes sense to us is irrelevant. If God states a cause, we must not doubt the information. Additionally, scriptures indicate that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all possess the attributes of deity. God hasn't asked us to understand how that's true, nor has he called upon us to explain it. If I deny it because it doesn't make sense to me, then I'm no longer interpreting the scriptures, but am now denying them. Well, that's now, that now gives us eight rules for interpreting scripture. And in our next video, we're going to add two more rules. I hope you'll join me for that study.